Well, it's nice to meet you. Thank you for uh, reaching out to me. It's nice to meet you too. I'm always looking forward to discovering new people. And um, I saw, especially like podcasts with the last year, um, I listened to a bunch of podcasts. So it's really great to discover uh, new people through podcasts. Yeah, I, 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 most of the people that I've had on, I've known personally in some way, but then there are some that there are a couple now that, um, that I haven't met in person and yeah, every time I reach out to someone, I, especially like complete, like with, with you, we have, we have a lot of contacts, um, in common, but there were a couple people who were just literally off Instagram and I just liked what they did and I messaged them and I've been amazed at how like I think I've been rejected once and it was because they were too busy you know like it's it's amazing like more people are interested in connecting than we think we're lacking also contacts human contacts yeah uh so and it's such a a cool way I, I think the more you the older you get the less likely you are to just engage with strangers or people you don't know so like sometimes it's really cool to have someone being like hey I like what you do would would you like us to talk about it yeah just like it it feels like this like renaissance of like serendipity and like connection because everyone has just realized how important that is over the past year maybe Uh, as much important it is to connect with your friends but also like with just the barista the cafe Uh, Mm -hmm. or yeah it feels you just feel really good that you can talk a bit share something with a stranger yeah we're a lot more alike than we realize like our our experiences aren't like they're unique because they're ours but they're also universal right I find it harder and harder in the way that I guess it's the same for everyone but like with social medias when people will show just the good things that are happening in their life or like they choose a specific side of their personality to show Mm -hmm. so sometimes you think like it contributes to this idea that everybody is perfect and nobody feels loneliness pain or have hard moments so sometimes it's yeah just quick short interactions with people can help just remembering that yes we're we're not alone in whatever if you're a musician or working at a restaurant like we might experience the same thing I heard that quote once um when you're comparing yourself to people on social media you're comparing someone else's highlight reel to your blooper reel (laughs) oh that's really good because you have all the information you have you would know the insights of like all your little insecurities and like all the past mistakes and you have all that in your database but you only see you know their like ha- their abs and their um you know perfectly curated videos or photos yeah. from here and there I try to make a post that also show my vulnerability like I remember the first time I got a grant a Canada Art Council grant it took me three times and I, I still remember like one day sitting on the couch trying to start another grant and I started to cry because I was like god like it might not happen I'm spending so much time for maybe nothing when will I get some like validation from big institutions like that and so when I made a post saying like I got like I'm going to Austria and it's um like I got a grant for that I was making sure I was like also by the way it took me three times so like don't give up if you're Mm -hmm. in the same the same position so yeah there's a great podcast speaking of podcasts on a podcast it's called re we regret to inform you the rejection (laughs) podcast um or maybe in our business it should have been called thank you for applying to (laughs) but the number of clients were really high this year yeah really high this year it was a really tough decision Yeah. yeah So, um, and every episode is called rejecting so-and-so. So So for example, there's a rejecting Lady Gaga or rejecting whoever, really famous people. And they go through and talk about their journey to becoming um, who they are with an emphasis on all the opportunities they didn't get. What what was your biggest rejection, you think, in your life? Oh. On any aspect. 
Well, I remember my first rejection was really, really hard. Well, I don't know if it was my first, but it was my first sort of professional rejection. Mm-hmm. I um, auditioned to Claude Watson School of the Arts. I was young. I was like maybe 12 or something. And I was auditioning and I just had such a horrible audition experience. Mm-hmm. Like I remember playing, I think I played maybe it was like Bach A minor violin concerto or something. And uh I remember the guy there, like just, I finished and he was just kind of like, okay. And it was just like such a horrible feeling, especially when you're a kid, right? And like the look on his face was just like so unimpressed. And um, I kind of like felt embarrassed in front of my parents even, even though they were so supportive. And so they didn't do anything to make me feel embarrassed, but yeah, just feeling like they thought I wasn't good enough, you know? I, I know so well this feeling, the kind of shame that yeah. you didn't live up to the expectations of other, and maybe they didn't have any expectations for you, mm-hmm. but you build a scenario in your head that you need to succeed, yeah, to otherwise maybe your parents won't love you as much or, yeah. Yeah, those, those formative experiences really stick with you. Yeah. Um, I had a really abusive teacher when I was in my teens. He had a reputation for for being uh, for having a huge uh, temper, outbursts, really intense outbursts, and saying really horrible things. Like he would say things to people like, "You don't need a violin teacher. You need a therapist," and things like that. Uh, yeah. No, he was really old school too. And uh, I remember one time I came in. He didn't like my preparation. He didn't like how I'd prepared um, whatever. I don't even remember what I was playing. I was 15 and he said, uh, I thought you had integrity, but I guess you don't. And he walked out of the room. (laughs) What? Yeah. Integrity. Like it went from like, huh, maybe you didn't practice this week, which wasn't even true. Like I had practiced, but maybe, maybe not enough. I don't remember. Um, But to say that to a kid, to just be like, Hmm. I thought you had integrity. Like he dug deep to the core of people's yes. soul and just made it so personal. He knew what he was doing for sure. There was a week where I guess I didn't call because I was very mm-hmm. busy at school and I, I didn't come for a lesson. And so we would also have these weekly master classes at mm-hmm. um, near Mount Pleasant in Toronto um, every, every Saturday. So we would have our lesson during the week and then show up to these master classes that had all his students present. And I, so I didn't call him one week for a lesson and I showed up to the master class and he said, in front of everybody, he said, what are you doing here? And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, why are you here? And I said, oh, I'm here for the master class. And he said, well, I thought you weren't interested anymore. Uh, so he basically said I'm not interested in having you in my class anymore and that was super traumatizing how old were you uh yeah around 15 still um so I was you know crying and I called my parents and uh they said you know what let's just we'll, we'll call his wife his wife was sort of uh had the reins in a lot of ways and they called her and she said you know what we'll call him I don't know we'll call him John for the purposes of this story John is very sorry um he you know it's okay I'll talk to him and she talked to him and then I was able to come back but the fact that like thinking about that now the fact that I was willing to accept that behavior and like subject yeah. myself to it and keep going back to someone who would do that who would just yeah. so fly off the handle like that um instead of approaching it with rationality and like maybe reaching out during the week to see if I was still interested I mean or see if something had happened to me or yeah, it was not your fault I mean it was just a miscommunication and a very innocent one and um 
yeah. So those, those early experiences, especially in classical music, I find like are very formative. They mm-hmm. leave, they leave scars. They really do. Yeah. There's still sort of a, a lot of emotional abuse, especially yeah. in the old school way of teaching. Yeah. That was just kind of accepted as being part of um, a, a set of tools to make the student better. It's it's crazy. Like there are few um, few places where you you have an hour only with the teacher. Like you're one on one, and even like in other arts form like theater or dance, most likely it's in group, right? So like this person can have a really big power over mm-hmm. you. His opinion was everything to me. I mean, exactly. I remember it just it meant everything, which is the de- it is the device that yeah. was that is used by abusive people, right? Exactly. And I I'm only I only learned that when I was an adult. So yeah, as a teacher myself, now I'm taking I'm really making sure that I don't want to establish. I really like, I'm the master. I know everything about trumpet and you need to listen to me, but really more being a, a guide mm-hmm. to the student, whatever, like there are six or there are 35 being like, okay, you just played that. What do you think? How do you feel? Do you think you can improve that? And trying to work side by side with the student. There's a book, I haven't read all of it um, yet, but it's called The Music Lesson by Victor Wooten. He's an amazing oh, bass yeah. player. And it's all about the, the teacher as the spiritual guide, almost like, mm. you know, coming and, and guiding us to, to the force within us. That's already music, you know, yep. already there. Can you tell me why you wanted to come on the podcast? Oh, sure. What, why, <laughs> what, what your interest was? I'm just curious. Yeah. Um, first, I really like the title of the podcast, the name of it, like Non-Essential Worker, oh, okay. because... I think that like it, it, I particip- I started participating in podcasts last year um, and I thought it was such a nice way to, to just have like, I don't know, talk, just not playing music, but like also talking about it in a really vulnerable way. I'm now in my 30s and I kind of feel more confident about my artistic person about what I do also reflecting on what what was my past because like I think I've been trained to believe that um maybe it's the same for you like that I should follow an orchestral path and this is where I would find happiness and success um and I discovered that it was not my path at all I was not happy Um, And I could be better at doing other stuff. And also um, looking back, it's been four years now since I graduated from my master's degree. So looking back and how there were so many few women, a few women in the brass section and the trumpet section and trying like, since I'm out of school, like to also build a community. I'm someone who works a lot like with models. I love, I'm Sometimes I'm comparing myself too much, but I also love comparing myself to people I admire, like just to see what was their path and how did they achieve that? Because I think what they're doing is great. When we're talking about failure and everything, like I didn't have the perfect straight path. Like I did that and that, and I always stick with music. I could have chose something else. It was, but like, I feel, I don't know, maybe like a couple who've been together for, Many years you go through storms, fights, but you believe deep down that this is what you meant to do. This is what you love to do. And you would be so unhappy mm-hmm. not doing music, not doing art. So, and I, I was look, lucky enough, I guess, that soon enough, which was still late at the end of my master's degree, I was like, I don't want to do auditions to work, to find a job like in a really small town or to play second trumpet for an orchestra, I won't be happy. But contemporary music allows me to mix all my interests of like dance, theater, music, creating new rap. And I think I'm way better at doing this than trying to play what most people are trying to do. And so, yeah, I feel like talking to podcasts is just a way, an easy way too, because 
we're not even in the same city right now and it's easy to connect so mm -hmm. I, I I guess I'm doing it I don't know if I could be a mentor uh, I've been a mentee many times and I really like it so I guess if I could just if some people could listen to me and be like oh okay yeah you can you can fall and you can <laughs> continue mm -hmm. and you don't have to to continue like doing what everything is telling you to do you can just find what you're good at and find what you have pleasure in do you think that there's a certain type of person that's drawn to contemporary performance or contemporary music do you notice a pattern in the types of people that are more drawn to that yeah i i think you need to be willing to to be out of your comfort zone and be comfortable in being out of your comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And I can see it like in other aspects of my life. For example, like my friends will tell you um, that I tried every class as possible. Like I did African dance, I did gum boots, I did mime, corporeal mime. I'm this kind of person who has like, I'm, I don't know what's that. Um, maybe I have no talent for that, but I'm gonna try it because it seems so fun. So. I have this ability, I think, to be like, I know nothing about this. Let's try it out. And it's weird because at the same time, I'm such a perfectionist. Um, but I'm also able when it's not related directly to music. I think I'm able to let myself go more so I can bring that then after the music. So, yeah, I would say people who are willing to to explore to and I have, I think, you need to have a bit of an entrepreneur um, threat of personality because it's not like, I feel when you're playing in, a, in an orchestra, which I know less about it because I'm not, but like you have a contract, like the gigs are coming to you, you have your rehearsals. So you, didn't, you don't need to hustle that, more, that much. And in contemporary music, because it's so new, everything has to be created. Um, unless you are in some ensemble, mm -hmm. but still most of the time, like the, the new music ensembles are not that big then, you know, like orchestra. Um, so you need to be willing also to, um, to work on grant application to, to promote yourself. So what I hear you saying is that you, you kind of need to have a, a natural curiosity for different things different sounds and different things and you need to have a willingness to step outside your comfort zone and do something that you're not necessarily used to yeah and also a sense of the hustle yeah <laughs> a exactly. sense of of um promoting yourself connecting with other people um networking and making opportunities for yourself rather than exactly. relying on others to give them to you. Yeah. Even when I was younger, I was always the one in my group of friends to be like, okay, let's go play bowling this weekend. Let's go to the beach. I was the one leading and organizing things. And I don't know if it's because I'm an only child. I'm going really deep into that. <laughs> but like, um, I know that if I wanted to go play with friends, like I didn't have a brother or sister or like if my parents were busy, so I kind of needed to go to people rather than waiting. And since I was young, I was like, if you want to see people, just ask them, like, worst case, they will be like, no, I cannot come with you. I'm busy or I'm not interested. But so, yeah, uh, I think like since I'm young, I'm, I'm willing to be like, or maybe I, I have this kind of leadership to be like, let's organize something. And now today it's like, let's create a project. Let's meet and let's start something new mm -hmm, mm -hmm. really cool and so you mentioned mime briefly and I saw that in your bio too can you tell me what is your background in all of these things like theater dance mime and how do you how are you planning on using them within your musical life that's really interesting I think I was six or seven when I started to take um, jazz ballet as they call mm -hmm. it so kind of a mix of ballet and more contemporary move and I remember I had my little costume of a lion because we were dancing on Lion King music <laughs> and so I started then to to do dance and I was I really loved my dance lessons um then when I was in high school there were some um 
after school, you could get into the theater uh, troupe. So I remember doing that and I always had an interest. I, I wanted to be an actress before being a musician. I still remember going to the movie theater to see Titanic. <laughs> and I was, I don't know, what was it? 1997, I think. Old school. Yeah, so I think, I guess I was seven or eight and I was like, whoa, this is so impressive. You can just, all the emotions I was feeling and I was like, I know it's not true, but like, this is so cool. So I wanted to do that. So like taking some theater classes helped me. And because I was in like in music in high school, so I had my music lessons and then uh, theater after school. And then when I moved to Montreal, it's gonna be 10 years uh, since I'm in Montreal in August. So I was always like one semester, every semester I was taking a different new, a new different uh, dance class. So I did gumbu, African uh, ballet, contemporary. And for me, it was really a way to, I'm someone who's thinking a lot, sometimes too much. I'm really in my head. So do like dancing was a way to reconnect my body and my mind. And also like, you know, you dance on music. So you like music, so it's really cool. And so, and also like it helped me like dancing. I, I used to be, when I was a, um, a teenager, I was a bit overweight. And I remember like not coming from um, a sportive, active family at all. And when I started to train and like, I was like, oh, I can, I can like my body now because my body is capable of doing things. Mm -hmm. So dancing also is a way for me, like to just be like a bunch of different bodies and being like, wow, we're, we don't care. Like if you're overweight or whatever, like it really helped me reconnect it with my body and liking it, which was really important. And then um, when I finished school, um, my uh, was always something that like the, the capacity to tell something, to make people imagine an object or a place for me, it was crazy. Why I wanted to take mime is that because I discovered gestural music, mm. um, which is most likely performed by percussionists because they're used to have different bunch of instruments and reading this kind of notation that has many layers. But I remember, I think it was, when was it? I went to Banff for a summer program with Ice Ensemble. And this is when I started to dig more into like discovering that it was a thing. And I was like, whoa, this is so great. Like you have movements that are notated. So, and I was like, if I want to do that, I, I want to be good because I saw so too often musicians trying to act and it was not good. It was like poor, but it's normal because we're trained to play our instruments. We're not trained to communicate emotions through our body. So I was like, if I want to do that, I want to be good at it. So let's dig into that. So cool. So you went to mime school basically to become a better musician or a more yeah. expressive musician. That's yeah. so, so cool. Yeah, I, it kind of reminds me, my my father was a an actor. He's retired now, but um, he went to clown school. Oh, uh, <laughs> to become a better actor or to discover a different side of acting, I suppose. But anyway, that's really awesome that you were, you have that, yeah, it's that curiosity of exploring, like, what else can I do that I can sort of link to what I'm doing, you know, and what can I learn about that will enrich what I'm, what I'm performing? Yeah, exactly. So what was mime school like? What's the school called? And what did you do there? So it's called Omnibus. It was two classes a week, two classes of an hour and a half, or even maybe two hours. So it was really condensed, but that was cool. So actually you learn everything like from, it's a, like mime comes from a French tradition. So you have, for example, 50 different walks, kind of walks. You have some, um, the, the pyramid, like how to isolate certain sections your body so like start with the head the neck the the shoulders then the trunk 
and then you can move back. Um, you have poses. So I guess like in ballet, you have like the number one, number two, blah, blah, blah. Uh, you have some poses, so, so you learn them. And it's, it was a lot of exercises with eyes because when you're miming, your eyes will tell a lot. A really good one was like, you need to do um, a path and you need people to image in where you're going and you need them to come back to your initial point. So it's being aware, where am I going? And I need to come back the exact same way. Hmm. So like if I was in an apartment, I'm going down the hallway and I'm opening the door, but like the door is still in the same spot. Your yeah. mind, you're creating a space. You have to make it feel real. Exactly. So it's a lot of awareness of your own body, which normally we, we're maybe less aware because we can talk, we can speak. So sometimes even if your body is not super clear, like by talking, it's going to become clearer. So, um, and sometimes we had like improv. So it was just trying to, you, you don't need to tell the story you're creating, but you just like, you'll be two minutes in front of everyone and you'll just be trying to communicate um, something or sometimes it was two by two. So like really looking in the eyes of someone else and trying to, sometimes we had, the, there's also like different, arm gesture, different um, trunk gesture. So let's say the teacher will give us limitation. You cannot, you only can move your arms and your trunk, but not your head. So what can you do? And so it was really, really interesting because I feel most people were not aware of our body. Our body is just living on its own. It sounds like it exists at a cross section between theater and dance. Yeah, that's a good way to put it, totally. Yeah. Where does the tradition of the white face come from, the, all of the makeup and all of that? Oh, that, you know, the white face, it's a good question. And I think I probably look it up before, but I know that for the black clothes, we, we had to wear black clothes in our class. I didn't get the memo the first class. And of course I had like glittery top with... <laughs> But like the, the point is just to have no distraction. Mm. We just want you to wear black. So I, I'm assuming white would help to your super neutral. Right. It's like you just see a block and then it's uh, right. it gives you a white canvas too. Sort of statuesque. Yeah. Yeah. That's very interesting. So how many were how many years were you there or months? Oh, it was just like four four months. I might go in Austria this summer. Let's cross our fingers um, with everything that's happening for Impulse Academy. That is a contemporary music academy. And I'm doing a, 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 like a workshop with Francois Sarrand, who's one, one of the most, um, one of my favorite composer of gestural music. And the name of the workshop is Body as an Instrument, Instrument as a Body. So I feel this is the kind of, workshop that will help me to to continue this um this way of expressing music not only just through the instrument but through the body one thing i noticed uh on, about your bio it said it says you incorporate noise as well as other types of um extended technique or experimental sound, atonal, things like that. And I was curious how you, how you define noise. What, what does that mean? What's noise and wh why is it different from other types of sort of organized sound? Good question. Um, for me, noise will be this kind of sound you wouldn't expect, a sound that is really against what your instrument can traditionally do. So for me, it will be it will be to go against a beautiful, pure trumpet sound, a super loud and powerful, brilliant trumpet sound, and instead playing with super high pressure. And so the only thing you hear is like squeaking of my lips and air and maybe a bit of saliva. And then, uh, or using a wacky whistle with a mute 
So it will create like really deep vibrations. I think for me, sounds will, noise will be something that might not be at first agreeable to the ear, but the more you dig into it, it's like exploring the quality of this sound. Yeah, I'm kind of tired of like the trumpet sometimes being like this typical fanfare, trim, like fanfare instrument or like, and I love this sound, but sometimes I feel we, everyone thinks that trumpet is only like a loud instrument. And so I really like, and especially because we can add mute, uh, we can take away parts of our instrument, like a slide of that. So it's really easy to create new sounds. Very cool. Do you have any advice for um, classical musicians who might want to start improvising but don't know where to start or find it, um, yeah, intimidating? I think a good way sometimes is just to look at graphic scores that are easily also uh, findable on the internet or just even what can be really cool. It's like you, you draw some things and you try to interpret it like you know you draw some dots you draw some lines colors I think it's a good way because it gives you we're so especially like classical classically trained musicians we're so used to have a piece of paper in front of us so if we can just replace the notes by drawings and shapes it can help and I would say to also try to meet people and try it because the first few times I tried it by myself, I was like, what? I'm, I, I just started to do more improv solo stuff. For years, I was doing it with people, but like, I think it's maybe starting with people because you can, sometimes you can, you, you have three things you can do, right? You can imitate the person with the sound of the person. You can be completely the opposite of the sound of the person, or you can try to complement it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like three ways to see it. So for example, if the person is playing one, something that's more of a melody, you can play the accompaniment, vice versa. And so I think it helps a lot. And there are also great games like John Zorn, Cobra. I was just thinking that. Yeah. I was just thinking that, like making it into a game, right? Exactly. There's a, a friend of mine named Ethan Mitchell, who um, he had this tradition where we would meet in the park and you know, a bunch of us and it was rotating. Sometimes some people wouldn't come that week and others would come and we would meet and just stand or sit in a circle and um, have little games, improv games, um, you know, uh, set out a series of rules at the beginning for whatever the next yeah. section of the game would be. Sometimes some people would sit out and watch. Yeah, imitate, compliment or go against what you hear is a good way and also for me, I know it took me time to develop. For me, improvisation is about developing your own vocabulary, like your own set of effects and sound. Mm. And so for me, it was like, I know, I know really well the trumpet. I've been playing it for many years. What if I play the trumpet without a slide, without my mouthpiece? So it's also like, it depends. Like I know, for, but like for a violin, it could be like if I'm detuning the string, um, things like that. So trying to take out or add an accessory to the instrument is also a good way to, like I remember the first time I put a trumpet in the water, I was like, whoa, this is such a cool sound. And so you can just play around with that for like 30 minutes. I've known my instrument for a long time. What's the or next step together? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You mentioned being a female brass mm. player. Um, and I was curious, what, 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 what is the significance to that specifically mm -hmm. with the brass aspect? Because I know, I mean, being a woman in all sorts of contexts can come with its own challenges, but uh, what, what does that mean for you? For me, it was learning how to find models, uh, realizing that I've been surrounded by men most of my training, listening to Canadian brass, who had one women back in the days that sit uh, listening to sing sec orchestral sections of brass only having men or maybe a woman or two in the horn section Le hearing play with your balls 
when I say, oh, I'm scared of this high passage, this has section, and the guy is just being like, just play with your balls. I'm just like, <laughs> sure. And it took me, it took me like time. It took me like, I needed to be out of school to realize that I might have changed a bit my behavior, especially during my undergrad to try to fit. I realized that hearing man, dude, bro in rehearsals mm -hmm. and sometimes it was like every time it was like little micro attacks mm -hmm. because these words were never used to to talk to me and so it feels like they have their own crew their own gang they're like mm -hmm. hey bro what are you doing this weekend you're kind of on the outside a bit exactly mm -hmm. and this is why i'm saying i think it's unconscious but the vocabulary the words we're using is the easiest thing to change but it's also the thing that is more like of a habit mm -hmm. because for many years we've been like no no but like when we're saying hey guys guys means everyone mm -hmm. why is a man like a masculine word signifies everyone mm -hmm. why wouldn't it be hey gals hey women hey girls i don't you know it makes no sense and it's not because we use that for years that we shouldn't change it and i can i cannot even Imagine for brass player from like, like, if, like who are queer or also because they don't have model as well. For years, people were thinking like women cannot play brass. Uh, you need like bigger lungs. You need to be bigger. Um, you're not strong enough. And we need to change that because it's not true. And the funny thing is that for in high school, most of the time it's well balanced. Like you will have as many girls and boys playing, but at a certain level, university, I feel then there's a drastic um, change. Like there are few women continuing and it's a mix of like, we're still encouraged to follow an orchestral path. And in orchestra still today, there's a bunch of men playing in brass section. So it's not encouraging. You don't see yourself. It, it's crazy because still, Today, especially for from older people, I hear like, oh, you played the trumpet. Whoa, that's rare for women. Or mm -hmm. like the, or if I'm saying I'm a musician, it will, oh, yeah, you, you play, let me, let me guess, you play flute, right? Or piano. Mm -hmm, right. And every time I say trumpet, it's just like, oh, okay. So it's mm -hmm. like this image of brass instrument being like, you need to be a strong, muscular man. I'm part of a Facebook group who's really like advocating for if we see a festival with just a lineup of men, people will, that now we're starting to talk about it and be like, hey, these are really great musicians and maybe they're not um, aware, but like if there's no women in their lineup, think about younger students, they might not subscribe to it, mm -hmm. register to it because they don't see herself themselves nobody ever was mean to me but it's this atmosphere and this bro attitude that can be really heavy over the years mm -hmm. and so it's slowly changing it's changing but I think yeah I think we need to keep talking about it most orchestras I would any audit orchestra I would audition for they usually have you know a um, inclusive hiring process, at least in their mandate, right? And you hope that everyone can be unbiased, but you just don't know who's on the panel. Exactly. It's, uh, it's hard to know how to navigate these things, but I'm glad you're, you're speaking about it because I'm sure a lot of women in brass would appreciate it. Uh, there's a podcast called Bold as Brass. Um, I, do you yeah, follow part, them? I participated in it. Oh, <laughs> great. Year. Okay. I think it was last fall, but it's a great podcast. Yeah, great. Yeah. I really appreciate you coming on. It was such a pleasure getting to know you and speaking with you today. Yes, thanks for having me. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye. Bye.